Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We're entering into a series in the book of James. There are four major lessons that we will cover this month. But first, we're going to talk about trials. We'll define what a trial is versus what a trial isn't. We'll talk about having a divine mindset and what it looks like to get divine help to do that. So if I could summarize it, it would be this. Faith is grown through experience. And that's going to start off kind of, what does that mean? But by the end of it, you should be an expert. Faith is grown through experience. And so to kind of get our minds moving in the right direction, I want to talk about unwritten rules in our society and social norms. I feel like we've talked about this before, so if we have, give me some grace. But, but I'm going to list off a couple examples of this. Ladies first. How many of you have heard that? Ladies first. Okay, for you ladies who haven't heard, you're welcome. Okay, the boat is sinking. It's women and children, then the men. Not the other way around. Here's another one. Uh, and for some of you, this may be the first time you hear this. When you eat at the dinner table, chew with your mouth closed. <laughs> Please. We're not having seafood all the time. Here's one. Make eye contact when you're talking to somebody. That one can be tough. Here's one. There are two questions you never ask a person, especially not a lady. How much do you weigh? And how much money do you make? You don't do those things, right? Okay, here's a big one for me, is don't show up places unannounced. If I haven't been invited, I'm not going to be there. Because there's nothing worse than it's like, hey, where'd that guy come from? What's he doing here? here here's one. And this one, I've told you this before. I've, I've done this to people. So you're walking down the hallway, and I'm looking at Blake, and I say, Blake, how are you? Blake, what are you probably going to say? Good. Okay, thank you. He's going to say good. And then Blake's going to ask me the same question. And how are you? And I'm going to say, good. You are not allowed in American culture to stop and be like, well, actually, I'm not doing too great. Tax season's here. You're not allowed to do that, right? Because no one actually cares, right? You've experienced this. And, and I've gone places and actually asked people and done the, but how are you really doing? And it's like, no, because you're not supposed to. But one way or another, you've seen this. And maybe the biggest way you've experienced this is when somebody violated that very rule, right? And it's kind of like, ooh. And, and I think of the, the, the funniest example I can think of is it's, it's D group on a Friday night. Uh, for those of you who are a part of this, we always have a giant potluck. And can you imagine if like me, Seth, Nick, and Drew, like all the ladies and kids are lined up and we just like get in their way and like, no, I'm coming in, we're eating first. Like people would be like, Ooh. but maybe you've seen somebody that broke that social norm and you were just like, it's kind of painful. It's kind of handshake fails are the one that make me sick to my stomach. Um, but here's why I bring this up. As Christians, if you're in Christ, there are some things that over years we've just kind of accepted. This is just part of who we are. Uh, perhaps you're in a habit of weekly church attendance. We just do that. We set aside our weekend and we go to church on Sundays. It's what we do. Or, or maybe you give a percentage of your finances because, well, that's just kind of what Christians do. What, whatever you want to fill it in with. But here, here's where it gets messed up, right? It's when someone new to the faith comes in and they start asking the questions. Well, why do you do that? And now, what, well, we all knew this, right? This was an unspoken rule. These are things we just do. And now I have to walk it back. Now, here's why we do it. And I think that's so fun because there are a lot of lessons I had to learn as someone who wasn't raised in the church. And we'll get to those in a moment. Um, but every time someone new comes to Christ, we're starting from scratch. It's, it's now, you're a wee baby. And so I want to say it this way after I tell you a story. Okay, so before I forget this, I went to a conference in January with Kristen up in Savannah, Georgia. And there was a story told, hey, I'm just going to let you know in advance. I'm going to say the word hell. It's going to happen. It just did. You're welcome. There is a guy who was, remember, we talk about in this youth group all the time about you pray for your one. This is the person I'm, I'm praying that God would use me to lead to Jesus. And with that, the lead pastor had a guy he had been working on for years, a big, tall, probably tatted biker dude. And here's what happens. The guy gets saved. And he gets invited and he comes to church the next Sunday and they're in the lobby. And here's literally what happens. 
The guy goes, hey, pastor, how the hell are you? And this happens. And, and so what do you do? That just messed up your church. We don't say swear words. We're a Christian. But, but the point is, like, what do you do? This guy just got saved. He has a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Hey, pastor, how the hell are you? And, and here, yeah, sorry. And here's how, here's how Pastor Cam responds. He says, no, hey, brother, it's how the heaven are you now, right? And, and I just think that's so funny. But I love exactly what, the, there's, a, there's a teachable moment there because it causes us who are kind of in this Christian bubble, like, yeah, we just don't hear those words as often, and we just don't talk like that. And then, bam, there it is right in front of you. Um, but I want to talk about the dear, younger you. Uh, I've had the privilege of watching some of you grow up a little more than others. Uh, but, but here's what I know, regardless of that. In all of our story, there is a point when you were born again. And if you were born again, that means you are just a wee babe in Christ. You are a new creation, which means, guess what? If, for those of you who like those home remodel shows, and I don't know why you like those, um, but those home remodel shows, you are a brand new project under construction um, with a budget given to you by God. On the other side of the baptistry um, is when God started working on your heart and started to change you into this, this new creature and this new thing. And uh, maybe you were like me, um, where you didn't quite understand that Christians try not to say vulgar things, that we don't swear like sailors, and that we don't insult people. Or here, here's a big one that I know a lot of you are, are going to be working on as you get older, is when somebody says something and tries your life, I don't always have to fight back. Sometimes the best thing I can do is just, like, I'm going to pray for this person because they need Jesus right now, and I'm not about to give them Jesus, so I'm just going to move out of the way. Uh, but we don't slander others, and we don't retaliate with insult or even fists, if that's you. Um, Here's a big one, something that you have to swallow as you grow in Christ is I'm not just called to love those who love me. I'm called to love everybody, even the kind of personalities that drive me bonkers. I might be the one that drives you bonkers. You might be the one that drives me bonkers. I got to love you. I don't get to like you. I have to love you in Christ. Or, or maybe this, we commit to being part of God's church, being part of God's family, which means everything I do is examined in community. And that can be scary. That can be really scary. And with that would be this. Everything I do, say, plan should be considered an act of worship to God. And that's high level. And here's the deal. Like, I'm, I'm giving you some of my convictions. I'm giving you some of my convictions. And there's a lot there. In fact, way too much to unpack. And that's not even the point of the message. I just wanted to say, like, this faith is grown through experience. And these are some lessons I have learned over the years making mistakes learn over the years by having mentors who poured into my life. Uh, but, but here's what it comes down to. That knowledge that's in the head has to make that long seven inch journey down to the heart. And, and I can say these things as your youth minister and that be true, but it has to at some point become true for you in a way that you actually understand. Does this make sense? Uh, you have, and, and it will, it will. Um, if faith is grown through experience, then I know there's going to be growing pains. And part of those growing pains, one of the most painful ones is this. Life's tough. And as long as life's tough, that means I have to learn how to do something that's unnatural to me. And you're going to see something that is very unnatural in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. And we, we can talk about how joy is different than happiness. That's, that's for you to figure out. But let's start reading James chapter 1. We're going to read 2 through 4. Here is what James says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There are a thousand sermons and devotionals and, and guided prayers on a passage like this. There are some big words to talk about. Perseverance, when you think of that, another word might be endurance. Another example could be patience, which some of you pray for more than others. But what I did catch is this. It said, when, not if, you face trials of many kinds. It's not an if. If you're a Christian, I think it's John 16, 33. In this world, you will have troubles, right? But I think it's really important then knowing that I have to do something unnatural to me. And that's when I go into a trial, when, I, when something comes up against my life and tests my faith, there is a posture and an attitude foreign to me that the, the brother of Jesus, James, says, I have to learn how to have, and that is joy. 
And that is joy. And there's a big difference between joy and happiness. Joy is a momentary, joy is a thing we can tap into. Happiness is a fleeting thing. And we've talked about this in the past. Uh, but let's define a trial. I want to give you three examples of things trials are not. A trial is not, I got grounded because I stayed up late so I could post memes on the BCC group chat. That is not a trial. A trial is not, I was a jerk to somebody and I burned a bridge. I ruined a friendship. Not a trial. Or here, here's one. I had $30 that I was going to use at the camp store and I lost them in a pair of pants. And now I'm broke. That is not a trial. Trials are not self-inflicted pain. Trials are not, I was a jerk or I was a turd. Trials are something that happens in an external way. And here's what a trial may be, because I don't necessarily know if you can define it so simply. If you read verse 1 of James, it says, to the scattered tribes, uh, here's the deal, the church was persecuted very heavily in the first century. Uh, and in our case, we not, may not face the same trials. But here are some examples. I was treated poorly for being a follower of Jesus. I was maybe cut off from friend groups or treated in a different manner or, or talked down to. That would be an example of a trial, because my faith is now being tested. Another example, you could be wrestling with a particular sin and you don't feel like you can overcome it. You've been praying to God, would you take this? Would you help me have a new attitude about this? And guess what? God's not just going to zap you and fix that. That might be a trial. It could be an area you're struggling with, doubts you have, or, or struggling to develop a spiritual habit of reading the Bible daily and praying and kind of learning how to, to live with God. That could be a trial for you. Uh, here, here's a big one for a lot of people is at school, in co-op, at home, People are going to try your patience really, really hard. And you might go, Jesus, I'm pushing my very end. I'm about to snap on somebody. And you might find your faith tested there. Here's one. Um, you might be at your very limit emotionally, and then someone wants to vent and pour all their crazy on you. And now you have to be emotionally available for them, even though you're like, but I need that myself. That could be an example of a trial. But I know this. Trials are things that push us to our very limit. Trials are things that cause us to look ourselves in the mirror and see the ugly. Trials are the kind of things that tell me, based on how I respond, this is what I believe about myself, and this is what I believe about this particular part of my walk with Jesus. It gets really ugly because you have to look at who you really are when you're pressed. Not only that, trials teach us what it looks like to trust God and start doing things the Jesus way. Uh, because the way we naturally respond it's not how Jesus would have us do so. Here, here's the typical mindset. I, I hear this everywhere. I see this on social media. And maybe, just maybe, you, you've fallen for this too. And I'm going to call it a karmaic worldview. Uh, here, here's how it is. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. They're the people who, man, me and God are doing awesome. And I'm just reigning in all these blessings. And things are the way I thought they should be. If you think you're right with God when that's happening, eh, and then you find yourself on the other side. Okay, things are going really bad. My Bible reading's not good. I'm not praying as often. I miss church. I'm struggling with sin. Whatever your thing is. And you're like, well, God's mad at me. Eh. What I'm trying to say is if you live in a transactional worldview, where as long as I do good, me and God are good, but as long as I do bad, me and God are bad, you're setting yourself up for a strict judgment and something that you'll never be able to live up to. Maybe you've heard them say, yep, karma got them. They got exactly what they deserved. You're aware of this idea of grace and unmerited favor. We don't get what we deserve as Christians. But I hear it so often. So many people, Christians and pagans alike going, yep, the universe taught them a lesson today. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? Because there has to be a better way. Romans 8, 28. Here, here is my suggestion to you, a better way to think. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So, so what does that mean? I can't operate in this, woe is me, me and God aren't good, therefore I'm being punished, I'm going through a trial. You can't live here because there's got to be a better way. And if I know that the Bible teaches me that God loves me, he's called me according to his purpose, and he's worked this together for good, then I promise you this. And then when I walk into that season where my faith is being tested, where I do feel under trial or under fire, God loves me and he's working this for good which allows me to have, you guessed it, joy in all circumstances because faith is grown through experience. Faith is grown through experience. We're going to have to learn how to have a divine mindset. Some people call this a biblical worldview. 
starting to see the world as Jesus sees it, starting to understand why the world is full of suffering, why the world is full of things that try us in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I've overcome the world. Um, but if we're going to consider it all joy, then we have to stop focusing so much on ourselves and focus on the bigger picture that God has for us. And with that, if we need a divine mindset, then we have to ask for divine help. So let's keep reading in James, starting in verse 5. It says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Verse 6, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I think it'd be really easy to make this into two separate sermons. But what I really want you to catch is between verses 4 and 5, it talks about let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything, but catch what James does. If any of you lacks wisdom because we need wisdom to consider it all joy, then you should ask God who gives generously, which means we, in order to have a divine mindset, I need divine help because naturally the things I'm privy to do, well, it's just not it. But did you catch just a little bit of a warning there? I don't want to call it a catch 22 because that's a weird phrase, but there's a little bit of a warning in praying a prayer like this. If you're going to ask for wisdom from God to summarize it, you better mean it because if not, you ain't getting nothing. And so here, here, here it is, the tension. You might have prayed, God, would you get rid of this thing in my life? God, would you give me the answer? God, would you help me find your plan? <laughs> but you prayed that prayer and then you didn't follow through. Why did you expect God to follow through? If you're not going to meet him halfway. And so I want to give you two examples um, of the kind of things that this would be like. Here's the first one, a junk food addiction. And I'm using something silly. Here's the scenario. This is not a true confession, but work with me here. I'm addicted to eating 50 Twinkies a day. Should that be true or not? It's up to you to check my pantry. But imagine then I'm like addicted to Twinkies. That's like my life. That's all I eat. And I go, God, I'm addicted to Twinkies. <laughs> They're so good. I, I want to eat a frozen one. They're so good. But, but here, here's the deal. And you go, God, take this away from me. God, I don't want to be addicted to Twinkies anymore. And then imagine God responds and says, well, show me your food pantry. Because, here it is, right? You might go a couple days clean without Twinkies, but then we open up your food pantry, and when you open it out, falls an avalanche of Twinkies. Did you really want help? Did you really want to change? Because you might be able to armor up for two or three days and do a little bit better at not eating 50 Twinkies a day, but as soon as you feel weak, as soon as you, that ugly part of us that comes out, and I have full access to that thing I'm addicted to, well, guess what? I, I probably should have never prayed that prayer in the first place because I showed God, yeah, I wanted help, but... I didn't really want help. I actually wanted to keep this part of my life. Here's the second one, which is a little bit more serious or tight. Dealing with rude people. Uh, if, if you struggle with patience and handling the out-of-pocket comments of people, that means you're, you're a human. When people try your life and come out of nowhere, and you might pray, God, I really just need to have more patience because people are rude, people are in my face, and they're doing the kind of things that make me want to lash out. If that's you, well... Then if we reflected, like you, you started logging every time someone was rude to you from Monday to Friday, and then you wrote down how you responded, I'd ask you, how'd you do? You prayed, God, would you take this from me? God, would you help me be more patient? Were you more patient that week? Did you show up to actually do your end of the prayer, to do your end of the deal? If not, then James would call you double-minded, and he would say, you should not expect to get anything. I, I call this a somewhat dangerous prayer because it requires action. Because in your relationship with God, if you're just waiting for him to zap you and take away that problem, <laughs> get in line. We're all waiting for that. We've all prayed that prayer. And that's not how it works. Because if your belief costs you nothing, then there's no substance to your faith. And your faith is probably dead. Anything worth having is worth fighting for, right? And if we keep making the same mistakes over and over again, here, here we'll get to a question beneath the question. But before that, it would be this. What does this say about that area of our worship to God? If everything is to be evaluated as worship, and I'm not giving up that thing. If I'm not actually submitting it to Jesus, well, what does that say about my worship? It, it might have some disjointed aspects to it. So the question beneath the question, and I want you to think about this really, really well. I want you to really think about this. Do you really believe that God can transform your heart and your mind in the areas you struggle with most? Do you really believe he has the power to do that? And if so, 
Do your thoughts and your actions reflect such a belief? That's when it gets, uh, that's when it gets real. Because you go, wow, you know, Jesus, maybe I haven't trusted you with that the way I should. And if you need to repent of that tonight, we all do. We all do, but maybe this is the first time you thought about that. Because if I'm going to ask God for wisdom, darn it, I better mean it. Because if not, don't expect him to show up. Don't expect the blessing. Don't expect the breakthrough. Don't expect anything if you're not willing to actually go through on your side of the deal. Let's talk about applying this. Because you will face trials. It's, it's, not a, it's not an if, it's a when you face trials. But in the midst of trials, we're called to have a divine mindset, to consider it pure joy so that this perseverance can develop in us maturity so that we're complete, lacking nothing. And then he says, if you're lacking wisdom, ask God for it. But don't doubt, because if you do, you won't get anything. Let's apply this. I think we have to live it and go through it. You know what I mean? Because here's the deal. You're going to pray to God for all sorts of things over the course of your life. God changed my heart. God helped me work on this. And you know what? God might answer that prayer over a series of months and years. And two years from now, you might go, I'm actually a little bit more patient. Huh. I expected it right away. But faith has grown through experience, walking step in step with Jesus. Sometimes you're going to have to kick, scream, and struggle bus before you're willing to actually give that aspect of your life over to Jesus. And that's part of your walk. Hey, sometimes you might have to fall on your face and spit dirt out of your mouth because of how hard you face planted, uh, because of how stubborn we can be as humans. Aren't, aren't you stubborn? Is anyone else stubborn? You're like, you know, Jesus, I want to give you that, but mm, we're still holding the reins. Okay. The passage we looked at, it was, it was when, not if, right? It's when, not if. And some of you might be in the midst of a trial right as we speak. And so I would ask you, how's your worship? <laughs> how's that working out for you? Um, and as long as it's true, I know this, that if I'm going to face trials and I'm called to face them with joy, then I know God loves me. He's called me according to his purpose, and he's working this together for good, which allows me then to have a lasting joy, not a happiness. So I'll leave you with this, and then we'll head to small groups. As your faith grows, uh, I look forward to the stories of you being able to look back that thing, whatever it is in front of you right now that looks like a mountain, that thing that's impossible to climb and it's insurmountable, when you're on the other side of it, you might be able to look back and say, I can't believe I lost sleep over that. And, and God, I can't believe how you did it, how you brought me this far. Uh, and, and maybe you can say, hey, dear younger me, just know this, hang in there, it was worth it. Hey, dear younger me, it was worth it because God's gonna grow you in an area you never thought possible, but first you have to climb over that mountain so you can see to the other side. And I know it's a cheeky illustration, um, but man, what if mountains on the other side were just barely even hills? Something that, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't think God could work on that. And if faith has grown through experience, then through that, as your faith is tested, as you go through trials, you're going to see that God is faithful and that he works through messy people like you and me. Somehow God has brought you this far. Surely he'll lead you through your next trial, right? So consider it all joy.